feel overwhelmed. I'm not qualified. I don't have that anointing or that power. I feel inadequate. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong thing? What if I pray and nothing happens? And you know, it's all about us. We're, we're forgetting who our God is. We're forgetting that we're doing this in His name, by His power, by His authority. And we, we get that feeling of, I, I just don't have what it takes. I don't have what they're looking for. And because of that, we avoid people. We avoid those that, that have needs. We, someone, we see someone that, that looks like they have a need and they're walking to us and all of a sudden, oh, I've got to get over here and talk to this person. Because we're afraid they're going to impose on us and ask us to minister to them. You see, if we don't see them, if we don't talk to them, we're not put on the spot. We may not have what they want, but we do have what they need. You have what it takes. You have what people need today. Look at the expectation of this man in verses 2 and 3. And let me ask you something else. Do, do people expect to receive anything from you? Do they expect to get anything from you at all? This man was in a position of expectation. He expected to receive something from everyone who came by. That's why he sat there. He knew this is a good place to be. I'll sit at the doors of the church because people going in, being the good Christian people they are, they're not going to turn me away. And as I ask alms, I'm going to get a lot of money. So he had an expectation that as I sit here, they're going to minister to my need, to my want, to my desire. And when you're in that place that you need something, you begin to expect that people are going to give to you. After retiring from pastoring but entering into this new phase, I'm working at a homeless shelter. And we have people come in all the time expecting us to give them something, a place to stay, food to eat, a shower, all kinds of things. They even expect things that we can't give them. But they expect something from us. And, and this is where this man was. He was in a place of expectation. Now, if he wasn't expecting anything, could you imagine what his life would have been like? I'll sit at the gate, but I don't really believe anyone's going to give me anything. I don't believe anyone is going to minister to me, so I'll just sit here. Without that expectation... It wouldn't have been long before he starved to death. It wouldn't have been long before he was gone. His need would not have been met. But in his position, he came to know those that he could expect to receive something from. You realize that you have a look about you when you have the presence of God in you, that people can look at you and say, oh, they've got something. It's not that look that says, I've got something that you don't have and I'm going to keep it to myself. But it's that look that says, there's something about me, that the presence of God in me, that I have what you need. And he, he began to realize that person, they, they look like they can help me. That person, they look like they can help me. But he didn't let those go by that didn't look that way. He asked everyone. He wanted to receive something. But do you have that look that tells others, I have what you need? I have something for you. You ever have someone just walk up to you and say, you're a Christian, aren't you? There's a look about you. I'm not talking about the way you dress. I'm talking about that presence, that joy, that, that love that is in your life. Do you have that special something 
that tells others they can come to you because there's something special in your life that can meet the need that they have. That expectation. He was in that place where he was expecting to receive something. So what, what do people really expect from you? What do they expect from me? All too often they come to us with a wrong expectation about us, about what we are, who we are. And many times they're only interested in the material things that we can give. Pastoring, we, we had people that would call all the time and say, can you help me with my rent? Can you help me with my electricity? And, and I, I always, it, it bothered me when someone would call and say, can you help me with my electricity? I'm going to be cut off and say, when? Tomorrow. And how much do you owe? I owe three months. Why did you wait until now to come and ask for help? But they, they, they have this idea that being Christian, being a church, it's our obligation to supply all of their physical needs. Give me money, give me food, give me whatever I'm asking of you. After all, that's, that's why the church is here. And, and I've had people tell me that. That's why you're here, to meet my needs. So they, they look to us for the physical needs. Other times they look to us to gain approval for the way they're living. If I can get the church, if I can get a, a, a Christian to approve of the way that I'm living, then I'm okay. Then everything's all right. I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to worry about changing the way I live. I don't have to worry about making a, 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 a change in my life. And, and, you know, becoming a Christian is all about change. The old man dies and the new man is born. All things are done away with. All the old ways are done away with. We're now a new creature in Christ. We see a lot of sinful things going on in the world today and, and people look to the church and say, you need to accept me for who I am, the way that I am. God made me this way and therefore you have to accept me and if we can accept them, then they don't have to change and worry about making their life what God says it should be. Let me tell you, we love those people, but we can't condone the sin. We love each one of them, but we can't condone the way that they live. Then on top of that, we have others that look to the church expecting to receive ridicule or judgment. They're used to hearing people jump on their back because of the way they're living. And they come to expect it from every Christian. We've got to show love. We've got to show mercy and grace. Again, not condoning what they're doing, but show them love. So there, there's a lot of expectation that people have of us in the church. A lot of things they expect from us. This man was expecting the gift of some money. That's what he was after. He sat there asking for alms. Alms, alms, give me money. But notice the endowment of the gift. In verses 6 and 7, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. What do you have to give? If you had that lame man right here, right now, could you go to him and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And would you expect it to happen? Well, I, I, I don't have that in me. I, I've not been called to that. If you're a believer, you've been called to that. If we were in that same situation, what could we give that man? 
Many of us, we, we see people, they're, they're in need, and we look to them, and, you know, they, they've come to expect us to meet their needs because many times that's all we will do is meet their physical need. They're asking for salvation. They're asking for deliverance. They're asking for something to help them through life that will get them out of the place where they are, and we'll just reach in our pocket and say, here's 20, go buy you something. But we have more to give. And I realize that many of us in our own resources, we may not have a lot to give. That's where Peter and John were. And Peter said, we don't have any silver or gold. I know that's what you're wanting. But I've got something better. And you know, you you talk to people at times and, and you bring a need to them and or they'll bring a need to you, and, and what do we say? Well, all I can do is pray. That's the best thing you can do. That's one of the best things you can do. It, it's not all I can do. All they had to give was Jesus. Give what Jesus had given to them. What do you have to give that Jesus has given to you? What has Jesus given you? I started to put people on the spot and say, what did he give you? I'm going, what, what's, what's he given you? Grace. Rhonda, what's he given you? Peace. Rod, what's he given? Brother Ted, what's he given? Hey, that's awesome. That's a great gift. But, you know, you look at this and you start seeing, I have a one-dimensional thought. What has Jesus given me? He has given me this. But each one, we can bring up something else. And you really think about this. On the surface, we come up with basic things. He's given me salvation. He's given me eternal life. We do have forgiveness. We do have salvation. We do have eternal life. But you can go through and you you start reading through the Scripture and you find out He has also given you wisdom, peace, joy, happiness, comfort, gladness of heart, power over all the power of the enemy, power to heal, power to raise the dead, faith, the Holy Spirit, rest, love, encouragement, inheritance, direct access to the Father, protection, protection from the enemy. He's given you that teaching and direction. He's given you everything that you need. 1 Corinthians talks about divers' gifts, and it talks about those things that that he has given unto us. You know, we may not all have the same gift, but that's why we're a part of the body, so that we can all be used to minister to the need. But we sat back, and I don't have silver and gold to give you, and... I have Jesus, but all I have to give is a small testimony. That small testimony can mean a lot. It can mean a a great deal. We've received truth. We've received all these things from the Lord, and we should share them with with others as the Lord directs us. But what happens? Do we really expect to give? God's not going to ask me to do that. I I, I know for years God was calling me to ministry, and I said, no, I'm not going to do that because I didn't feel qualified. I didn't feel adequate. I I, I didn't feel like God really wanted me. And we, we get to feeling that we're not there. You see, the problem is we don't know who we are in Christ. Do you know who you are? Do you know what it says about you? Do you know what he believes about you and what he knows about you? Luke says he has given us power over all the power of the enemy. I don't feel like I have power. You have power. He has given you power. 
And, and if you go back and read the Greek and look at that, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. The enemy has power, but you have authority. And there's a whole lot of difference. I know a lot of powerful people. I know a lot of people that they're strong and, and they can do things, but when you've got authority, that changes everything. That changes everything. God says, I give you authority. I give you this authority. And I, I think back there when we were in Africa and we didn't even know that we had to be worried about this cobra that was across the river. But God gave us authority and took care of it without us even knowing it, without us even having to worry about it. But do you know who you are in Jesus Christ? 1 John 4, 17 says, As he is, so are we in this world. You got that? As he is, so are we in this world. And I know the scriptures leading up to that talks about his love. But we are his love, and through his love, he has given us power and authority. He has given us all that we need. He has given us the gifts of the Spirit. He has given us everything that we need to be victorious in this life. But we live beneath our privileges because we don't know who we are. I haven't been called to preach. I haven't been called to pastor. I haven't been called. If you are a Christian, he has given you the commission, go you into all the world and preach the gospel. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Do all these things. You have been empowered. And then when you take in that, that as he is, so are we in this world. We have no excuse. But we don't know what to give. We don't expect to give to others. And too often what will happen, someone will come to you and say, you know, I want you to pray for me. Just a minute, let me get the pastor. Let, let me get one of the elders. You have been empowered to do this. You have the power that you need. Everything you have received from God, you're to minister the same to others. We get the idea, oh, I, I'm going to pray and I'm going to seek God and I'm going to get the Holy Ghost and I'm going to shut it up my bones and I'm going to say I've arrived and I don't have to do anything else. They received the Holy Ghost. They were endued with power for service. And that Holy Ghost power is for service. Not to sit back and say, I've arrived. You haven't arrived. You've just been commissioned to go. But we don't really expect to give. We come to church expecting to receive, but we don't expect to give. When you come into this house, you should come in with expectation. If you are sick, you should come in with the expectation, I'm going to be healed. If you're lost, you should come in with the expectation, I'm going to be saved. If you're broke, you should come in with the idea, I'm going to, you are with the expectation that God is going to provide my need according to all the riches and glory. We don't have to beg, we don't have to plead, but we come in with an expectation. But then once we've received ours, then we sit back. But no, we need to start come in, coming in with the expectation of as they come in, I'm going to minister to what their need is and let God use me and be a blessing to others. Peter and John said, we don't have what you're asking for. We don't have the silver. We don't have the gold. But we do have something that we are going to give you. He got the, he got, they got the man's attention. I mean, you, you got a guy sitting there asking for something and someone said, I don't have what you're asking for, but I do have something I'll give you. Okay, anything, I'll take anything. You ever been there? You ever been in that place? So they gave him Jesus Christ and his healing. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They weren't rich as far as the world was concerned but they were rich as far as God was concerned because they were empowered. They had the anointing. They had the answer 
of this man's life. They had the answer for the need of every person that they would come in contact with. But notice something that we don't do usually when we pray for people. They took him by the right hand and lifted him up. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. You know, it's one thing to say the words. It's another thing to reach down and say, now get up and let's go. Anybody can say the words. And usually what we do when we pray is we'll pray the words and then we'll end it with, but. No, pray it, believe it, put it into action. Believe God for what is going to take place. They took him by the right hand. Their faith says, don't sit there anymore. Get up. Let's see what God has done in your life. And by reaching down and helping him up, they were helping him to believe. I mean, this man's never heard this before. They've never seen anything like this before. But they knew by what name and authority they were doing this. And it was in the name of Jesus Christ. And therefore they had the faith and they had the anointing. And they knew that if he has empowered me to do this, I can say what he has told me to say and I can put it into action. He has given us all the authority. He said, the works that I do, you'll do, and even greater works than these. He's going to work through us. He's going to do those things in our lives. But not if we sit back and, and we're afraid to, to let God use us. Expect to give to others. And once they gave him the expectation and they gave him the gift, Notice what he did. There, there was the entertainment. There was the in, endowment, the, the, the receiving of the gift. Have you ever been given a gift that you really didn't care for? You ever get one of those Christmas gifts? It's like, yeah, right. And what do we do with it? We pass it on to someone else or we hide it away in a closet? We, we've all had those things that someone has given us. And, and, and I look at what I, I see in our world today. We have an entitlement. We have a, an idea that you owe this to me. And, and we try to give them. No, that's not what I want. I want something else. I, I've seen those videos on, on the Internet where they give a child a gift. And he throws it down and says, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this. And he and just goes crazy. This man was glad to receive the gift that had been offered. He could have acted like a child. I was asking for gold. I was asking for silver. You didn't give me. I don't want what you have to give. And you know what? If he would have rejected it, he would have sat there continuing to ask for silver and gold until he died. He could have thrown a fit. And you know, sometimes that's how we act with God. God, I want this. And God says, no, I've got something better for you. I don't want what you've got. I want what I want. And we throw our fit and we get mad and we pout because we didn't get what we wanted from God. He could have done that, but he didn't. You've got something for me? I'll take it. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And I, I can see Peter reaching out his hand. And, you know, we say, well, this is getting a little freaky. But he reached out and took hold of his hand. And he lifted him up. He had received a lot of temporal gifts. He had received money. He had received enough that he was living on it. But now he had a chance to receive something that would last Something that would change his life. He didn't know what they were going to give him, but they had gained his attention. Look on us. And we need to start doing that when people come in. Hey, look at me. 
My wife used to do that with the kids all the time. She'd talk to them. No, they weren't listening. Look at me. Give me your attention. And, and that's what they did. And, and, and people need, we need to get their attention. Look on us. We have what you need. He gave them, gave them his attention expecting to receive. And when he gave them that attention, they gave what they had. The power of God to be healed. Verse 7 says, immediately his feet and ankle bones were strengthened. He, now, you go back to the beginning. Lame from his mother's womb. He's never walked a day in his life. And when he's healed, immediately he's up. He's jumping. He's walking. He's leaping. He's running. He didn't have to learn how to walk. He didn't have to start here. He started out up here. That's the power of God. That's the glory of God. That's the, the, what God wants to be demonstrated in the lives of every one of us that we can live above just what everybody else thinks and walk in the realm of the presence of God. This all happened because he wasn't about to turn down the gift. He wasn't about to turn down what they were ready to give. It was a chance to receive the greatest gift he had ever had. Healing, a life changed, the ability to walk. I wonder what that would be like. I wonder what it's like to walk. I wonder how many times he had wondered that, and now he was having the chance. No more sitting at the gate begging. No more having to say, hey, Joe, carry me to the temple, would you? I, I got to go make some money today. And yet many people today are in the same situation. We receive those temporal gifts that don't last. We get by from day to day begging for a little help from this one and that one. But if we'd ever entertain the gift that God has for us, it would change us. It would change our outlook. It would change everything about us. Never have to beg again. There's power available to us today. He received the gift of God and immediately he was made, made whole. But how did he, exp how did he express this? What he had received. You, you see the exuberance of, of what happened? Leaping. Walked. Entered into the temple with them. Walking, leaping, praising God. When God does something in our life, we need to show some excitement. I told you about the, the guys that used to come to the church to see what happened. And they weren't disappointed, you know, at the end of the service, things that start happening, and they say, wow, what's this? Oh, that happens all the time. No, we need to show excitement. It, it's not just an everyday occurrence. It's the power of God. And we need to be excited about who our God is. What God wants to do in your life. How God wants to work in you. But this exuberance affected others. And you read on later and it says that many came to believe in the Lord. One man's life changed the lives of many. You know, we've got something to be excited about. We've got something that people need. We have what it takes and we have what the rest of the world needs. It's just we don't know it. We don't know it. I'm going to close with this. Think about the wonderful gift of God. And about the fact that as one of his children, you have been empowered. You've been entrusted with this power to change the world and meet the needs in the lives of people.
all of those who are credentialed, are in the process that God is calling you to, to ministry, I want you to stand. I want you to stand. Spouses with them, because you're in this together. You, you are in this together. And I know Pastor Rod and Pastor Ted, they, they know this. I'm sure you know this. But God's called you. You got to do something with the calling. When we were going through Bible, Bible school in, in North Carolina, North Carolina is divided in two states, Western North Carolina and Eastern North Carolina. Each one has probably five, 600 ministers credentialed in their part of the state with only about 400 churches. God has called them to ministry. So you've got around 600 ministers. This was when I was in Bible college. 600 ministers in this state that God has called to, to minister. And they're sitting there waiting for someone to die so they can get a church. If God has called you, it's time to get up and get busy. It's time to step out. I don't know why things work the way they do. God always sent us to a, a place that was struggling. But that's okay. God always took care of us. And he always will. Christopher can be a struggle. Been there, done that. But if you trust God, he'll take care of you. And he'll supply your need. But look at these people. They have been entrusted with the power. Not only they, but you, every one of you have been entrusted with this power. Do you know what God can do if you'll just let him use you? For, for years, you know, I said, God, I can't do that. I've been in other parts of the world, preaching the gospel, seeing souls saved, seeing demon-possessed people set free. I couldn't have done that if I would stayed home and sat in the pew and did nothing. Now, you don't have to go around the world to minister. You can minister here. But if God is calling you to go out and pastor, that's what you need to do. Sorry. But I want to pray for these. I want you to pray for these. And then we're going to turn it around and I'm going to have you pray for those that have needs here this morning. So would you stretch your hand toward these that are standing and begin to pray for them that God's anointing and God's power and God's will will be done. Would you just do that right now? Cry out to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see each one of these that are standing. You know their heart. You know their purpose. You have a plan for them. You know what needs to be done, Lord, and you have called them to do your work. Now, Lord, I pray for anointing. I pray for abundance. I pray for grace. I pray, Lord, for strength. Lord, I, I, I pray for compassion. Lord, I, I ask that you would just lift up each one and, and give them that special anointing and that encouragement they need to move from this place to the next phase in their life that you have for them. I know it's scary. I, I know when you told us to, to no longer pastor but move to the next phase, and I said, what is that next phase? You said, I'll tell you later. That, that's a hard place to be. But God, let us walk in faith. Let us walk in power. Let us walk in the anointing. And Lord, let your spirit flow through each one of these as you use them for your glory. Whether it's ministering here, pastoring a church on the mission field, evangelizing, 
in, in the chaplaincy, wherever it may be, God, use them for your glory. And now, Lord, let your hand be upon them in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm asking the rest of you, what's your need? What's your need? Do you have an expectation? Are you expecting something? Do you need healing in your body? Do you need deliverance? Got someone here that deals in deliverance. That God's empowered them and God has blessed them with that. So if you need that, it's available. If you would, everybody stand. If you need healing in your body, I want you to come right here. So I, I've been there before. I, it doesn't matter. If you need healing, would you come? Okay. You need healing. I want you to come. If you can't physically make it, raise your hand and we'll get to you. Okay, there's a couple hands there. Take notice of the hands. Some of you that God has called you to ministry, I need you to come now and begin to pray with these. It's time you step out. It's time you started using what God is. We've got a couple right here that need prayer here. Enola, right back here in the gray. Right there. Yeah. Somebody need deliverance this morning. And, you know, that, that's one that scares us. I, I need deliverance, but I don't want people to know I need deliverance. Maybe it's just something that's got a hold of you you can't get rid of. You need, you need to be set free. If you need deliverance, I want you to come. I want you to come. You need salvation. You see, it doesn't matter what the need is. It doesn't matter what the problem is. We have a God who is able. Now, do more than just say the words. Reach out. And those of you that have come, reach out and take hold of what God is doing. He says, here's your healing. I take it. I possess it. I make it mine. Bobby, you know what it's all about. You've been there. God's not through with you. God's going to work in you. God's going to use you in a mighty way.